welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson here with Greg Edinger and Brian Broom, and we are picking up our conversation from last week about the work of God's law. We talked at length last week about uh, how wonderful God's law is, how perfect it is, what a delight it is to live consistently with, even though we all struggle to do so with consistency. <laughs> is that um, we consistently struggle or we struggle to do it consistently? Both. Both. Okay. Yeah. I don't see a, a difference there. It might be a distinction, but all right. both. Uh, both is good. Both yeah. is good. To well, quote not The quite. Road to El Dorado, one of the <laughs> finest movies ever made, question mark. <laughs> Anyway, um, we ended last week with turning to Romans chapter one. Two. Two, excuse two. me. Romans mm. chapter two. Uh, Greg, would you read yeah. us the passage in question? Yeah, Brian had just been talking about the excellency of the law and particularly how it being God's law fits in so perfectly with God's universe as if, mm -hmm. well, they were made for one another. <laughs> And living Almost in God's like law is the best way to live in God's universe. And he was trying to remember what the verse that said that, and the verse that he wanted was the verse that we were going to, which is this kind of. This is Romans 2, verse 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their heart, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. We have to be careful to straddle a dilemma, if dilemmas are straddled, I don't know. <laughs> On the one hand, there's, there's two sides to this, as there so often are to biblical doctrines. We have to say not this, but not that either. Mm -hmm. Man is the image of God. Mm -hmm. Man was not simply made the image of God and then lost it all. He continues to be the image of God. And the Old and New Testament build arguments in terms of man still being the image of God. That's his definition. If he could erase the image of God, he would erase himself. He would no longer exist. Part of that is the moral nature he has that in some measure, even after the fall, still reflects the justice and the righteousness of God. The problem is, other side of the thing, the man's totally depraved and his sin touches everything, his thoughts, his instincts, his values, his priorities, his ability to interpret God's universe and to interpret God's revelation. And here we could go back and survey Romans 1, but we've kind of done that in the past. I'm not inclined to repeat it at this point. So as we look at the man who does not know Christ, but may be in many respects a good and honorable and admirable sort of man, we, we have to say a couple things about him. We have to acknowledge what some call the common grace, of the, the remnant of morality that God sustains in him, the voice of conscience that is kind of accurate about a lot of things. And yet we also acknowledge that he's fallen, and the things that he does right, he does not do out of faith in Christ. He does not do for the glory of God. And so in that sense, at least they, or at his, at his best, they're not works that are acceptable to God as far as giving him a proper standing of righteous before God. Mm -hmm. Because without faith, it is impossible because to Because without God. faith, it's impossible to please him. Uh, and whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And we are created for the glory of God. And when we do the things that are outwardly right, but we do them because it makes us feel good, because we would feel guilty if we didn't, if because, well, we love that person and we want to help them, or because we're fundamentally good people and fundamentally good people do things like that. I ran into a guy at the gas station last night who uh, was not homeless, but I was wondering for a little bit. And he came over and began making his excuses of, I don't want any money. I never asked for money, but I have no gas. If you could just maybe put some gas in my car. <sighs> Okay, fine. I went over there. I see his really nice car, nicer than mine, it's a, <laughs> and uh, his Suburban, I think, and uh, skis on the top. It looks like really nice skis. He says, yeah, I'm trying to sell those to get some money. Okay. Do you have any friends around here? Well, I used to. I've only got like one left because all the rest OD'd. Mm. Okay. Um, 
All right. Well, all right. I'll put some. I'll, I'll put some gas in your in your thing. But I'm not. Where are you going, Reno? I'm not giving you enough gas to go to Reno. Oh, that's all right. Whatever you got. Whatever you got. So I'm putting it in, and he goes on and says, "Thank you, thank you." Um, I don't remember how it came up exactly, but it says, "You know, I try to do good things for good." Oh, this is it. I try to do good things for good for people too, because I want to be a good person who does good things, because I know the good will come back to me. <laughs> And uh, but I never tell anybody this because I don't want to be known as somebody who touts his own goodness. I never tell people this thing that I just told yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and this I miss a, magical I, thinking that we've <laughs> talked about many times. Yeah, I was, the words "grace" were all in my head. Unfortunately, I failed as a witness. Honestly, I said, "Well, this considered us a cup of cold water in Jesus' name." Oh, bless you, bless you. Okay, you know religious language. That's great. <laughs> But here was this man. I don't know whether or not he really had any money or gas or not. I, I, I heard in my head the cup of cold water thing going on saying, it's only X number of dollars. I'll do this. God knows what's good. God will do something with it. Um, I didn't come full blown as I should have and said, you know, God's grace doesn't work the way you're describing it. Got a minute? Let me tell you about grace. I should have. I'm Shame on me for not. But I think this gentleman reflected a very common attitude among, well, at least Americans. I am a good person. I do good things. Uh, I know that good people often do good things just to show off, but I'm not one of those, even though I'm telling you about all this. Okay, this is, again, this is not a righteousness acceptable to God. I would, I would rather have this man doing good things and say, not overdosing with his friends. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not not mugging people at the gas station and taking their money mm -hmm. to get to Reno. That's good. <laughs> That's better than the than you know what he did is better than the alternatives or some of the alternatives. And yet, the, he falls far short, as I did, of the glory of God in this incident. The interesting thing about the the self concept there mm. of I'm I'm a good person, so I do these good things is that it creates a baseline mm. which allows you to do things that you yourself don't really approve of and say, well, it's the exception. In general, I'm in, a good in person. In general, I'm a good I person. I mean, I yeah. do this all the time, especially with habits. Like <laughs> in general, I do this when in reality, have I done that? No, I've aspired to do that. <laughs> and every day I have not, you know, gone to bed on time or you know, name yeah. My bedtime is ten thirty. However, I haven't gotten to bed before one in the last three yeah, weeks. Yeah, that. exactly. <laughs> I feel <called laughs> out. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Until you collapse and can't stay awake, and your wife sends you to bed at eight thirty. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. So this is this is the reality of man outside Christ. He wants to commend himself. And, and you know, the funny thing is, it doesn't matter how wicked he is by other people's standards. He will still tell you that he is fundamentally a good person. Yes, he's had to cut some corners, but generally there were good reasons for it. And there's a bigger picture and bigger issues at stake. And yeah, he slipped now and then, but no one's perfect. I'm only human. Excuse, excuse, excuse. But God's law demands perfection. It is one thing to say, here is the perfect law of God. I know I fall short. That's my sin, and I need a Savior. It's something else to say, well, close enough is close enough, isn't it? it Only also, in horseshoes and hand grenades. Yeah. It also becomes a problem when you say, and all of us who are close enough are going to get together and forge a civil constitution and a penal code that will be close enough to what this world needs. So we're going to ban murder. Um, except for babies in the womb and really old people and people who are no longer a benefit to society. We're going to ban theft, except, of course, by the government. Um, we're <laughs> going to uh, disapprove... Oh, adultery still in. Uh, uh, never mind. We're not going to make any laws about sexual things because that would be unloving, and we're all about love. And so it goes. We forge our law codes... We claim they are moral, that they represent the highest values and traditions uh, of the West or of humanity or whatever. And yet when we hold them up to God's or even up to simple definition of what do you mean by that, we begin to find them very deficient. Can I bring up a possible objection? Sure. Um, we've talked in the past about the civil law of ancient Israel um, and how part of it 
actually depends on sort of being close enough. Mm -hmm. um, capital punishment is in, um, you have a certain level of functionality, whether or not it's perfect. Um, and we've argued in the past that that is actually a strength of it, that it lets people get on with their lives. Um, how does that square with what we're saying now? Um, I'm not sure I'm following, but let, let me... Um, are you talking about the court system, which yes. was less than perfect? Yes. Yeah. The, interestingly enough, you just appealed to the Bible mm -hmm. well, yeah, to, to give us I'm exceptions. Saying, so even yeah. the Bible, when it comes to talk about civil government, says, and you're not going to get it perfect. This is a good message to our so-called sovereign citizens who think that no civil government is good enough for them, and they are therefore free not to obey any. The Bible comes along that. and tells us, in no uncertain terms, even the theocracy that God gave Israel wasn't perfect. Its justice was not perfect. Its courts were not perfect. Deal. Mm -hmm. Because it is more important to get on, as you say, to get on with life and be busy but, and to have a predictable, if imperfect, justice than it is to stand in line like they used to do in the Soviet Union, you know, for two or three days to get a pair of shoes, or in this case, to get a court settlement. Now we stand in line for months, years mm -hmm. to get court settlements. Ever anyone ever read Bleak House? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's there's an example. Uh standing in line as it were for years or decades mm -hmm. to get a settlement until all the money's gone. Uh and and so even in in Israel's civil government, there was a realization, acknowledgement by God that this is not a perfect world. You are sinners. You do not have omniscience. And whereas I do and could tell you, that's not how I'm going to operate. So you guys are going to have to figure out some of this stuff. And yet then he turns around and gives Israel a bunch of laws that tell them how in general to operate and how to distinguish some things from others. Uh, you mentioned capital punishment. This is going to be, this is obviously going to be a point of condition when Christians talk to non-Christians. Non-Christians generally do not think that capital punishment is a good thing. Capital fact, G, capital T. Yeah, exactly. I'm glad you heard the capitals in there. Yeah. Um, they would argue that it is unloving, unkind, and does not accomplish anything because you, the murderer killed one person, now you kill him. That's two people dead. How is that better? Aren't you doing exactly what the murderer did? And there are all kinds of arguments you can make, and some of them have a plausible sound. And yet God, with regard at least to first-degree murder, disagrees and says it does serve a function, and anyway, whether it serves us in any utilitarian way or not, he says this is what you're supposed to do. And all of our claims to be more loving and merciful than God uh, show us to be self-righteous and, in fact, trying to take God's place. So this is the kind of thing we're looking at when, when people come to their own stand, however they have them, whether it's tradition, whether it's a common vote, whether it's emotional feelings about a particular situation. Oh, I can't stand to see Granny getting old and sick. Can't we just put her out of her misery? You mean kill the old lady? No, I wouldn't put it. Yeah, well, I don't care how you put it. That's what's going on here. <laughs> well, it, that reminds me of uh, the line from that hideous strength, and I, I can't quote it exactly, but they're courting one of the main characters to join the NICE, which is, mm -hmm. for viewers who are unaware, is uh, the government in charge of morality, uh, but <laughs> bad. <laughs> and um, there's a line where they're telling Mark what he would do. He's a um, sociologist. Is that what it is? Sociologist, yeah. yep. That's mm -hmm. right. So this, they tell him, it's like, we want you to write stuff about what we want to do. And there's this line about, oh, yes. uh, you know, we. It's all. It's all about how you say it. Of course, mm. once we have full control, we won't need to worry about how we say it. <laughs> but while it's still in the in the balance, you need to phrase it carefully. You know, it's funny. Experiment is a bad word, but experimental is a good <laughs> yeah. word yes. because if you say we're doing experiments on children, it's bad. But if you say we put them in experimental education, it's suddenly oh, well, they they're just lining up. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And have you ever noticed that? Um, Eustace and Jill. Jill. They're in an were, experimental school. We're in an experimental yeah. education <laughs> class. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, how yeah. you say things does matter a lot. And we've seen that in, in our own country, particularly in the last few years, but for a long time now. If you call it social justice, then it's great. If you say you're doing this because you love people, that's wonderful. And how do you come back? You mean if I disagree, I'm unloving and evil and wicked? Or call somebody a Nazi? Not that anybody today has the slightest idea what the, mm -hmm. who the Nazis were or what they believed or what their political stance was. About all they know is that Nazis are somehow, and then there's this, they know they're bad. Excuse mm -hmm. me, what does bad mean in this context and by whose standard? But, you know, we nobody wants, at least nobody wants to be a Nazi. And if you are pushing this, you're a Nazi. Oh, I don't want to be a Nazi, so I'll move far away from that and be over here. And it's all about um, emotional manipulation and philological manipulation. Use the right word to scare people off. Or use and it the invites right word. the backlash of yeah. people who are like, okay, you're going to call me a Nazi. Well, maybe I'll be one. And oh, yes. That's <laughs> really bad. That's like, yeah. the, nobody likes any part of the situation. Yeah. And what happens? Yeah, there's what also the, the additional aspect, which is you call, you start calling everyone a Nazi. Mm -hmm. Then when an actual Nazi shows up and you yeah. call them a Nazi, they're like, oh, well, th that's what you've been calling us. So yeah. he must be on our side, I guess. It just it just degrades everything. Yeah, it degrades yeah. everything. And then there are some people who say, oh, that's what I am. Thanks for giving me a name. I didn't know. I'll go find out about the Nazis and be more like them. That These tend to be uneducated people in yeah. certain parts of the country. Um, but yeah, it's what we're lacking here is a clear standard. We, we, we're, we're groping after something or groping more accurately away from something. You know, you, 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 if you put some simple concrete scenarios before people, they'll probably give you the right answer. Should you steal this old lady's car, go for joy riding, smash it, and walk away laughing and, and never have to do anything about that? Most people would say, no, that would be bad. Um, should you shoot down a small child in cold blood for the fun of it? Most people would also say, that's bad. It's not something you should do. It makes me feel sad. It hurts me to think about it, whatever. But just push it a little further. But what about the child in question is dying of leukemia and is in great pain? And I shot her to take away the pain. I am her savior. Now, what do we say? Um, not sure. Excellent, uh, excellent defense. Face uh, the wall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and so we, again, the Bible acknowledges, and it, it, it acknowledges this thing, it calls it the work of law. It doesn't say the law. It says the work mm -hmm. of the law. There's a distinction. The, and different commentators have rendered that differently is what that means. Some have said it means what they, the, the acts themselves without the motivation and intent, or thinking of the law as the thing doing the work. The law has made its impress but the law itself is absent. Whatever it is, the apostle is making a distinction. He, yeah. in other contexts, speaks very clearly of God writing the law in our hearts, so do the prophets. Mm -hmm. This is something that's not that, and yet it yeah. is enough that it informs the human conscience because it speaks here a couple times of conscience. And this is an easy, easy uh, confusion. I've, I've mm. rarely heard this articulated as a difference. The, the law of God written in your heart as distinct from the work of the law written in no, your heart. It's, it, it is a difference. The, the work of the Spirit is to write God's law in our hearts, and it's an ongoing progressive thing, but it begins at regeneration when mm -hmm. we're born again. It's a covenantal it's a, it's, thing. It's what's promised yeah. in the covenant, that yeah. this is what we lack. That's the whole point. You don't have this mm -hmm. any more than you have forgiveness of sins, but God promises covenantally to supply these things. So whatever you had before wasn't this, but it bears a vague similarity in that it is still God's law, not some law you made up or your society made up or that seemed pragmatically useful at the time. And it's enough to inform your conscience that when you violate this work of law, when you violate your conscience, God says, you know what? You thought that was right, and you didn't do it. You thought that was wrong, and you did do it. You are guilty by your own standards. Let's let's just not let's not even pay attention to my standards right now. Let's look at your standards. You have standards, oddly enough, living in my universe. And you can't even live up to them, as you said earlier. I generally do this, you know, five times out of 11 or so. <laughs> God says, you know, nine times out of 10 is not enough because God demands holiness. He demands perfection. He demands perfect righteousness. And 
working out of our own stuff, out of our own intuitions, out of our own values, we we don't deliver. We don't even deliver what we say we believe in. Mm-hmm. Is it in James uh, that it, the Bible says, to him who knows what to do and doeth and it not, to him it is sin? To him it is sin. Yeah. So we can, now we can be very glad that people, human beings, have this work of the law in their heart and that it is mm-hmm. stronger generally where Christianity has been a social influence than in other places. There are exceptions. Uh, but, you know, if you grew up going to Sunday school, or if you grew up in an earlier age where even the Bible was, was read in public schools and where even TV programs were supposed to present some kind of civil morality, your conscience might be a little better informed than someone growing up today in the modern public school system who's never seen a church, never seen a Sunday school, and doesn't know the word Jesus except as a swear word. That doesn't help with regard to your eternal destiny, but it does make life a little nicer for those people who have to live around you. I would rather live by a man, whether he be Buddhist, Hindu, or atheist, who is honest in his dealings Mm -hmm. than by a Christian who cheats his neighbors and his his um, creditors all the time. <laughs> that I sounds would... like something Ventil wrote. You know, <laughs> I'd rather live, I'd rather be neighbor to someone with an extraordinary amount of common grace and no special grace at all <laughs> than next to someone with an abundance of special grace, but no common grace. <laughs> well, I don't, it, it's, the thing is the special grace does produce mm-hmm. character consistent with God's law eventually. Mm-hmm. But sanctification is a process, and there mm-hmm. are Christians, and, and in some respects, we all at sometimes fall into this, where we, we, we see what we ought to do, or maybe we don't because, because of other sins and unbelief, our judgment's clouded at the moment, and we fail big time and we hurt the people around us. And afterwards, if we're truly believers, we are embarrassed, we are shamed, we, we recognize our guilt, and we run to God for forgiveness, we come to the cross again, and then we turn to our neighbors and ask their forgiveness and try to make things right. So we, as Christians, we're not claiming we are perfect citizens or perfect neighbors, and yet in general, we work at it, we're supposed to work at it, we're supposed to try to be, and because of that, we're, we're kind of used to it, we know that it's valuable, and when, when believers who do not have the law, who have never been taught God's law, nonetheless are... Unbelievers? Unbelievers, yeah. sorry. If, they're, if they live noble, honorable lives, then we count that a blessing, and you can call it common grace. You can call it the work of the law. You can call it the spirit of God striving with man. <laughs> this harkens back to something you mentioned before we started recording the mm. Babylon Bee uh, yeah. designating Jordan Peterson an honorary Christian. Yes, because <laughs> he is one of the greatest defenders of Christian morality on the planet at the beginning <laughs> yeah. of the 21st century, although he himself does not claim to be a Christian. And I, as far as I know, has said very plainly he's not a Christian. Has, he, has that, that changed? I think that may have changed. At least he says mm, he he gets very particular with his. Semantics, I've seen a so lot of who knows. I've seen a lot of people try to mine his answers and be like, "See, this means he's a Christian now," and it's yeah. very unconvincing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because yeah. generally Christians who are Christians will come out and say, "I'm a Christian." I'm a Christian, and I've been baptized, words. and I go to this church, and yeah. under the authority of these elders. Yeah. Yeah, but so it's not, not that as far as I know. <laughs> but still, yeah. Yeah, I'd rather have Jordan Peterson for a neighbor than Adolf Hitler. You know, yeah. It's just, mm-hmm. with it, it, is, it is real and honest to recognize these differences of, and again, I'm, I'm not completely comfortable with the word common grace, but I'll, I'll use it, assuming we all know, in general, it means the overflow of God's special grace into the community and people around us. I would rather live next to someone who has a good deal of common grace, who's honest and hardworking and doesn't trash the neighborhood and doesn't take the Lord's name in vain, at least out where I can hear it, who doesn't worship idols or sacrifice his children, who doesn't uh, take his daughter every month or so to get an abortion. I would much rather not have that kind of person's neighbor and have the person who is honorable for obvious reasons. This goes back to what Brian was saying at the end of the last of the last program. I think when you put it that way, most, not all, most people would say, well, yeah, that's obvious. Yes, it is. Because God's law fits God's universe. And to live in a world where people don't still kill, rape, covet, um, defraud, embezzle, or sacrifice children on altars, 
I think we all got that that's, well, most of us have got mm -hmm. that that's a good, more peaceful, safer kind of universe to live in. But as sinners, we, then we start fudging, as I said before. Well, we're not going to kill, except, well, this isn't really, you might think this is killing, but it doesn't count for reasons X, Y, and Z. You mm -hmm. might think this is that, but it's not really because X, Y, and Z. You may think that... It, well, <laughs> Ten years ago, you could say, you might think this is adultery, but I, it's completely justified because my wife deserved everything I just gave her. Now we can't even talk about adultery because we don't even know what men and women are, apparently. It, the standards are slipping. Yeah. The slippery slope ceases to be a fallacy when it's historically demonstrable. <laughs> and I've when heard, it's yeah. innate in man's character, man will slippery slope down the path of disobedience, he will corrupt himself more and more. The wheat becomes more evidently wheat. Mm -hmm. Unless God intervenes, unless there's a move of God's Spirit bringing saving grace that overflows, then this is what will happen. It's not a fallacy. It's just the way human nature works. Mm -hmm. And so as we talk about speaking not just the gospel, but being a disciple of Christ, which of course is rooted and powered by the gospel, into the lives of our community, sooner or later we have to talk about a, the answer to a very simple question. How shall we then live? What does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? What are the standards? What are the standards for me personally, in my thought life, in my interactions with my wife and my children, my good friends, my community? How about my town and my city? How about as a citizen of the United States of America? How about if I'm elected as a judge or a governor or a legislature? How does, how does the Bible affect all of that? And am I left to say, well, you know, good enough is good enough. Now, here is the warning. That means we have to have a perfect biblical government before we have to listen to anybody. No, that is not what I said. When the gospel came into the Roman world, they did not have, Israel was not perfect. Rome was far from perfect. Actually, it was Israel who killed Christ. So, you know, neither one of them had to go in here. <laughs> they got Rome to do it. So everybody was guilty. Everybody helped kill the Messiah. And yet Paul and Jesus said, obey those that have the rule over you. But there's a difference between saying, this is where we are. This is where we begin. This is what we have to deal with. And saying, oh, but now you're given an opportunity to make a change. Will you? Or will you say, well, what we've done, what we've always done is good enough because it represents what most people believe. It will, it, if to change would be controversial. Um, it might look like a mixing of church and state. We wouldn't it, want to impose our beliefs. I would, yeah, we don't want to impose our belief on people who don't share them. One of the great lines for defending abortion. Well, I personally don't believe in it, but I can't impose my votes, my um, opinions on, well, then what are laws for? You know, what are laws Honestly. if they are not imposing your opinions and beliefs, your values on other people? And you say, well, it has to be the majority. Okay, well, practically it probably does. But how do you know you don't have a majority if you don't even try? And the, the majority argument also falls apart because the majority of German citizens in the Third Reich Yes. Supported the hideous acts and science that led to things like the Holocaust and various warmongering things they did in addition to that. Mm -hmm. Majority is not a logically viable argument. Yeah. This is your semi annual reminder that democracy means the rule of the mob. <laughs> <laughs> but, you, you know, it's a funny thing. When I was growing up, all you, the, when you wanted to face relativism, the one card you could always play was the Holocaust. Yep. Because you could always say, if people said, oh, well, it doesn't matter. It's all a matter of opinion. You said six million Jews dead. They would say, oh, uh, well, except for that. Um, and they'd backpedal and try to, to not, they didn't want to be associated with that. Within the last 10, maybe 15 years or so, we found that one, most people don't know what the Holocaust was. They don't really know who Hitler was or what he did. They don't know, obviously do not know who Nazis were. It's just kind of a square word these days. And the and if you actually explain to them 
Yeah, this was a whole country that decided it was politically expedient to eliminate 6 million people from their population. We're getting to the point where people, young people are saying, oh, oh, well, I guess if the society thought that was the right thing to do, it was okay for them. Um, yeah. What? Okay. <laughs> what I've been trying to wrap my head around for the past few years is how, you know, the Nazis enjoy, for lack of a better term, the status of, you know, utterly reprehensible without even people knowing what they did or what they thought or why they did it, while other heinous acts like the the Great Leap Forward in China, mm. which killed or the even Holodomor. more people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Holodomor. It's like this. This is totally unmentioned. Um, it it's just not reckoned with at all. So that this this idea of society's greater good is never never dealt with, never um, refuted. Yeah. That's not quite the word I'm looking for. I have a book and I, I don't I'm not I'm not sure this is the title, but I think it's the black book of communism. Um there's a similar book that's the black book of death or something like that. Anyway, these books are records of how many people died in the 20th century and what political agendas brought about their death, and it is a sheer enumeration. Mm. country by country, from Cambodia to Russia, from China to Nazi Germany. And what the figures show is that although Nazi Germany did kill a great many people on the order of millions, communism way outdistanced them. Uh, the Nazis have slain their millions and the communists have slain their tens of millions, more or less. And the interesting thing about the, the, one, the one book that was it was published in in France got a lot of heat. It was going to be bad, and maybe it was bad from the French school system because it obviously supported fascism over against communism <laughs> because it said the Nazis weren't as bad as the communists because they didn't murder as many people. And the authors of this book had to write a preface and said, "Look." We're not talking political agendas. And we're you not even comparing. Like, yeah. you don't have to compare. <laughs> yes, the Nazis were evil. Yes. These other people were also evil. There's no <laughs> statement of greater <laughs> or lesser evil here. Yeah, we're not, we're not, you don't have to be talking options and right wing and left wing do not necessarily mean Marxist and Nazi. But the um, established media has learned to use these words and words like left wing and right wing as signal words, as denotation word, or connotation words that just say, this is really bad, don't go there. And so they they picked, after Hitler lost, I mean, sometimes I'm asked, why, do, why, why does Germany get blamed? Because <laughs> they lost. Yeah. <laughs> the, same, the same people, the same banking institutions were funding both Russia and Germany during the Second World War and also funded the rise of FDR. Until it was clear that that Hitler was going to lose, at which point all of the Western prejudice turned against Germany because we don't like losers, but we kept up the pretense that the Marxists somehow were not that, mm -hmm. and then somehow we the press managed to slap Nazi Germany with right wing, <laughs> whatever that means in this context. Yeah, uh, I have an old history book, high school history book that that compares communism and fascism. Nazism. By the way, Nazis are fascist. Well, um, I, I will quibble with that. As <laughs> I'm always reminding people that fascism is an Italian-specific <laughs> system of thought. <laughs> All right. Well, they're, they're both national socialists, yes. which is the point. Communists mm -hmm. are international socialists. <laughs> right. And Italian fascism and, and uh, Nazism, which, by the way, is short for National Socialist Party, <laughs> Our national socialist. So here's the thing. The communists wanted to take over the world and make it all socialist. And Germany and Italy were content to take over their areas of influence and make it socialist. Yeah. Take over and, the world and make it Germany. Well, they didn't even want to take over the world in particular. <laughs> they just had, they wanted to go as far as they could safely until someone stood up to them and then they, they tended to back down. 
But the Marxists had it on their plate. Here's our agenda for the conquest of the world. Mm -hmm. That this was not a secret, but people kept pretending, oh, that's just an exaggeration, elaboration. They, they're not, I mean, they, the revolutions come, come on their own. They're not actually, there's no conspiracy. There's no funding. Third world powers. And, yeah, right. Anyhow, <laughs> sure. this, this book Just I like the, uh, the CIA isn't redacted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, very good point. And um, anyway, this textbook goes on and compares them. And basically, it says the same thing about each of them. Once it gets past the national and international, that they basically come down to, yeah. And the, th the one really difference, the Nazis hated the communists. The communists hated the Nazis. There you go. <laughs> Well, if you're both trying to take over Europe, you know, you probably might hate each other. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, well, that's, we need to talk about that sometime, but maybe, <laughs> maybe now we should get back to the main point, which I think we've nearly exhausted, which is this. There, there can be no appeal to some law in man's nature, which once we get together and talk it over, we'll all agree on, we'll nail, nail it down at least semi-perfectly. And from which we can construct a culture and a civilization and a law order. And here's the thing, which will be pleasing to God and will somehow be acceptable to Jesus Christ, even though it's not really going to name him, acknowledge him, or have a place for him. For Jesus, close enough is close enough. He never said anything about making all nations his disciples, after all. Hmm. He just wants us all to be fundamentally good people and have happy civilizations. That's not the gospel. Mm -mm. The gospel is about the conquest of the world to Christ through justification by faith, sanctification by the Spirit, rooted in the revealed Word of God. Tear any of those apart in the power of the Holy Spirit. Tear any of those apart, pluck anyone out, and you no longer have the gospel, and you no longer have good news. Jesus came to save you so you can go to heaven when you die while the world burns. Maybe good news for you. Mm. But it's not the same good news that God's preached to Abraham and he said, in you will all nations be blessed. And so as, as we wrap up this, this conversation, you have to be something called a theonomist to believe this. No, go back and read the Confessions <laughs> yeah. of the Reformation. Read the 39 Articles of the Church mm -hmm. of England. Read the Formula of Concord and the Augsburg Confession. They're Lutheran. Yeah. Read the, um, the Heidelberg Catechism or the Westminster Confession and the Shorter and Larger Catechisms. They are full of it. They all insist that God has a moral law to which all men are bound, and this was the common voice of the Reformation. And oddly enough, it was also the common voice of Christendom during the Middle Ages. Uh, Rome began to get admired in natural law theory through Thomas Aquinas, and yet fundamentally, everybody agreed that Christianity does have the answers. It took the Enlightenment to say, yeah, but your answers keep getting people killed in wars of religion. We have something, we have better ideas that won't get anybody killed. Please ignore the communists and Marxists right behind us. I, I will quibble with one thing sure. that you said, which is um, Aquinas also believed you needed special revelation. Oh, yes, of course <laughs> he did. Yeah. Uh, and the one of the things I've been interested to discover in the past year or so, is that um, natural law, at least as far as Christian theology considers mm -hmm. it, is not, oh, everyone has the law of God in their heart, and so we need to find all the common bits that everyone believes in, and that's that's what will order society. It's, no, 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 you need special revelation for God's moral law and his moral character. It just also doesn't contradict this, like exactly. because, yeah. because of the fact that God's world is the one that he made. <laughs> it's yeah. consistent with like what, what I mentioned yeah. at the end of last episode. Yeah. When God made Adam, his, the, the law of God was written in his heart, and it was a pure and complete law that was perfectly in harmony with everything God, God had said. That's yeah. man's natural state, his creative state. Sin yeah. is not natural. Mm -hmm. Sin has pulled exactly. us away from this. And this is why we all, for instance, say that it's wrong to murder, and yet we all tweak that, but we all tweak it in different ways. In every culture and every generation, we tweak it in different ways. And yet there's this constant tug back to something deeper and real, but our sins keep us from it. And the Bible comes along and says, Let, I'm going to tell you what's, what, what, what you're groping after or groping away from is this. And through the yeah. blood of Christ, by the power of God's Spirit, I'm going to give you the power to go back to it and to live it out imperfectly forgiven, 
until I raise you to glory at the second coming. Mm -hmm. So and yeah, yeah I, I would agree with everything you just said, Brian. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 it, and I wanted to go back as well to um, the other thing you said about how if you remove any one piece, it, it throws it all out of balance. Yeah. There's, there's multiple possible ways to fall into error oh, when it comes to absolutely. this, this, well, to, when it comes to anything, <laughs> when it comes to this in particular, because you can say uh, with the Anabaptists, oh, it only matters your personal relationship. Nations don't matter. Right. Um, familial relationships are at best secondary. Yeah. Uh, you can also fall into the other error, which is to say, well, we need the nation to be institutionally Christianized to the exclusion of anything else that matters, um, which is something that the Third Reich tried to do, as a matter mm -hmm. of fact. And so it, it really is like with the issues of Christology and the Trinity, it is about keeping things mm -hmm. at the same time, even though they appear to us to be in tension. They actually aren't. They it's aren't just a, because they find their unity in God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we have to yeah, receive that by faith and not think that we can figure it all out. And that's why, we, again, we need the scriptures to tell us not this, but that, not that, yeah. but this. Mm -hmm. And that's when we try, we try to trust our own logic and reason. We get into trouble, both because of the ineffability of God's nature and our need for special revelation, but also because we're stinkers and we want to screw things up. Yeah. And, and this, so we I Jesus. think, is the, the problem with Aquinas, as it is with every other Christian thinker, that everything you say can be taken to an error. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm not a fan of Aquinas. I have a knee-jerk reaction against Aquinas. Um, but was he a Christian? Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, we know. see him in heaven. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And the he's not responsible necessarily for the, the errors that grow out of his mm -hmm. really important work. You know, I mean, I he think, would probably have the Jesuits burned at the stake. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, but like, you know, I think mm -hmm. about certain errors that have come into certain sects of Christianity that can only come about because of one certain doctrine that's held, a true doctrine that's held right. um, very strongly. Maybe mm. that's really abstract. Let me just make this concrete and then yeah, it'll that actually would, That would help. Like um, the doctrine of covenantal representation mm -hmm. is the bedrock of federal vision. Mm -hmm. You mm. can't have federal vision without a view of covenantal representation. But you cannot have it without the wrong view exactly. of covenantal representation. Right. But it so has to be but it has yeah. to be a category of thought or you're never going to get there. Anabaptists exactly. aren't going to come up with it. Right. At least they may come up with the same kind of rules, but not for the same reasons. It'll right. be a different yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. So I mean, and I, that's a, a tricky thing as I think that's why education is necessarily a progressive thing. Yeah, we keep is learning. That, yeah, you keep learning. You keep learning to distinguish. Like yes. that's the, the challenge, you know. You well, can't just put people in boxes of these these are good people to listen to and these people I you know, I, I just stay as far away from them as possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well and that's also why pretty much every area of study ends up becoming a history course as well mm -hmm. because yeah. you you go through okay here's what they used to think and here's where this got corrected i mean every science class has included yeah. a history lesson <laughs> mm -hmm. um that i can remember yeah, and you should. obviously philosophy ends up being mostly history because you're tracking a development of general thought and i think that we we really do ourselves a disservice when we treat theology unlike all those mm -hmm. other studies mm -hmm. all those other sciences in the medieval period theology was called the queen of the sciences mm -hmm. it was the one that gave order and meaning to the rest of them right and yeah i don't know where that sentence was going but i i got i got <laughs> yeah. i got a lot of sub points in <laughs> you did yeah and, and uh, we've uh Made this an extended <laughs> appendix to the <laughs> conversation, so well, we should. Really think Greg said he it. wanted yeah. it to be short. That was yeah. that was a fun yeah. moment an hour that was ago. A good idea. <laughs> so this this is probably then a good place to call it quits for tonight. Yeah, I let's so. do some quick recommendations and head out. Ooh, ooh I have one for once. Yay, huzzah. Oh, good. I am on the uh, the distribution distribution list for Presbyterian Reform Publishing Company. 
I don't often see something that that really draws me, but occasionally they have they have some really great stuff. Was that an indefinite article, or are you talking about PNR? PNR. Okay. Um, a new book. Well, well, it's new to me. It's probably been out for a while. It's by O. Palmer Robinson, who I assume you probably know. He yes. wrote Christ of the Covenants. Mm -hmm. Came out in 2015, so it's an old book, I guess. <laughs> but it's called The Flow of the Psalms, mm -hmm. Discovering Their Structure mm -hmm. and Theology. And unlike most theology books, I'm actually reading it in order, line by line. <laughs> and I'm about halfway through it. And it is an absolutely fabulous book. It has all, this is the book of his old age, and it reflects not only all, only all of his learning, but his humility, his wisdom, and his realizing that sometimes you have to say something three times before people get it. <laughs> a lot of repetition, like, yeah, you just said, oh, and you're saying it again. Okay, but I, I'm going to remember it now. Uh, he talks about the five books that make up the Psalms and shows certain patterns in each of them that the the placing of a messianic psalm an obviously messianic psalm they're all messianic but obviously messianic psalm right next to a psalm on the word of god and then shows the psalms that follow and then shows that then you run into an acrostic psalm and then things change from that point on anyway mm -hmm. there's a whole i've only gotten wow. through the first two books yeah. but suddenly psalms is looking really really organized mm -hmm. <laughs> and to the point of saying oh you know if i learned these marker psalms I'm going to be able to tell better where this is going. There is a theme to each of these five books. Mm -hmm. There is an emphasis. And it's I'm 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 anxious to finish reading the book. And I think for those of you who want to know more about the Psalms, not as individual pieces or prayers or hymns, but as a book that actually has a flow and a point. This is an excellent place to start. I'm, I'm I know there are some other books who try this. Right now, this looks like the simplest, straightforwardest. Um, evangelical approach, The Flow of the Psalms by O. Palmer Robinson. Great. Uh, I'm going to recommend The Muppet Show <laughs> on a totally <laughs> different <laughs> note. <laughs> yeah. There we go. <laughs> yeah, we've had fun uh, Googling each guest star before we watch the episode so we know who they are <laughs> and what they're referencing because <laughs> it's all before our time, you know. <laughs> This is how my girls learned a lot of stars and starlets of an earlier generation. Mm -hmm. How do you know that person? We saw them on The Muppet Show. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. Works. I just can't wait for, because David's never watched The Muppet Show, but uh -huh. one of my favorites is when Alice Cooper is on. Oh, yeah. So. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. No. yeah. That actually yeah. wasn't. Um, they have the Star Wars cast on. Oh, that was a great episode. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And mm -hmm. uh, Julie Andrews. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's there's some wonderful stuff there. Well, I, anything with Julie Andrews is wonderful. Right. Yes. Well, Brian, how about you? Um, I think I'm going to recommend uh, following niche hobbyists on YouTube. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because um, actually right before uh, I, I hopped on to record this episode with y'all, I was looking for stuff on youtube to watch uh, with my wife who was eating dinner with me and we found this video it was an hour and 40 minutes long we watched all of it we sat down at first like let's just watch the first few minutes of it this will be interesting and then uh we ended up we were just so invested it was about a guy in bristol england who um lives with his parents and in 20 uh like the winter of some year. I can't remember for sure. Um, <laughs> In the winter of a year. <laughs> he started beekeeping. Oh. Mm -hmm. And we're watching this and we're just like, look at this guy go. Like he's, he's going through the course of about a year and a half learning how to keep bees. And like he had one of them swarm or he had one hive and the hive swarmed and he was able to stop them from swarming fully first and then a few days later they successfully swarm which if you don't know i only just found out an hour ago when i watched this <laughs> uh is when a hive gets too large and they yeah. basically need they they start making cells for queen bees to hatch from and then uh the new one leaves and i'm sorry the old one leaves and takes a bunch of the bees with her and mm -hmm. they go make a hive somewhere else mm -hmm. um and anyway, he goes through all this stuff. He buys the equipment to like harvest the honey. He's in America for a, uh, a week 
uh, on vacation and the the hive swarms a second time oh. <laughs> and he loses a whole bunch of the bees and before they swarmed they also ate a bunch of the honey that they had stored Aww. that he had seen oh um but by the time uh that winter's almost there he's gonna harvest the honey and he he got like 25 27 pounds worth of honey out of these things and it was just it was really adorable to watch because he's just like this probably not even 20 22 years old kid um who has a hobby now and he's like you know my parents let me live here and uh i just figured you know maybe they get a a free gardener a free chef <laughs> and a free beekeeper uh in exchange for a bed and a bathroom that they let me use you know i think that's fair <laughs> but uh it, it's really it's really fun and emily uh my wife emily wants to keep bees now for sure yeah. it was already it was already in her mind and now she's like oh for certain this is happening um yeah. my friend so, virginia's dad keeps bees that's oh, really? his retirement hobby yeah he, oh, that's so great. he gave us a little jar of honey one time and it had his <gasps> custom label it says the family beesiness <laughs> you know uh, oh, brian right. when you first introduced this what did you call it because i didn't recognize the words you were saying oh um niche, niche hobbyists oh okay <laughs> I heard Ish as in Ishi, the last survivor of his tribe. Anyway, that's okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, no, on not a that guy. Note, Brian, have you ever seen Jeb the Gardener on YouTube? Je I don't think I've seen Jeb the Gardener. It's so great. He opens each video with, hi, my name's Jeb and I'm a gardener. And it's like an hour and a half long. And it's just him like doing a gardening thing. Like here's how his strawberries grew this summer. Oh and it's I always it. set to like some really cinematic music. <laughs> it's, it's really wonderful. The other one I love is, um, I forget his last name, but I know his first name is Gerald. Uh, he is a pensioner who lives on the Isle of Man. Mm. And he... I don't think he does anything on YouTube, but he posts videos to Twitter and he's just like, I'm just harvesting my onions from this year. <laughs> <laughs> These are some lovely when he pulls up an onion and it's like, it's beautiful. And then like, he'll give you tips. He's like, if you really want good carrots, you should give them plenty of, you know, this mineral or whatever. And then he ends every video and he always goes, cheers. And he gives a thumbs up like really close to his chest and he's adorable. And like, we need to protect him at all costs. <laughs> So gardening, yeah. and, gardening beekeeping. and beekeeping mm -hmm. and just the fun show and homesteading the things. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, thank you. This has been a delightful conversation. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lovely wedded husband. Uh, thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling and buying us really nice new mics. Thank you to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. If you'd like to get in touch with us at any point for any reason, send us an email. You can reach us at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Uh, you can subscribe to our Substack if you would like to get our episodes in your inbox and also read transcripts. Uh, we have a lovely professional transcriptionist who donates her time to give us professional quality transcripts. And that is the way to access those transcripts is to subscribe to our Substack. Thanks again for listening. Hope to see you next time. Thank you.